So I think it's important when talking about evolution to talk about how populations are structured, how they grow, and how they decline. Populations are age-structured, but for many organisms it's difficult to know what age individuals are. So we can estimate their time in a population by looking at their size. Or for some things, maybe we can't even hope to know age, but instead classify them as to which stage of life they're in. Are they a seed, a seedling, a treelet, or a tree? So this doesn't assume that we know their age, but rather their developmental stage. And in any kind of organism, well, in any plant, it's possible to go from one life stage back to an earlier stage because of some environmental um, thing that happens to them, but of course they can't go back to the seed. In this three-dimensional plot, we can see um, a plot of individual pines per acre of a particular size versus the age of the stand, the time since that stand was cut or that area deforested. <clears throat> you can see in general the older the stand, the um, larger the diameter of the tree and the fewer individuals per acre there are. On the left, we can see photo documentation of changes in the population of a cactus on an island in Mexico. The Pachycereus cactus are, are kind of spread out of moderate size, and you can see how the individuals fill in over the years. Until 1996, there's pretty dense coverage on the left-hand side and center of the island. And on the right is a graph of the percentage of population in different life stages for Pentaclethra macroloba on Barro, Colorado Island, a beautiful big mesopinoid legume tree. The most individuals are seeds and smaller individuals and those in the larger size classes are a smaller percentage of the population. So I think you'll remember from ecology about little r, the intrinsic rate of increase, and lambda, which is the long-term population growth rate, little r is equal to the birth rate minus the death rate, and the log, natural log of little r is lambda, the rate of long-term population growth. To describe age or stage structure of populations, we can use linear algebra to express the proportions or numbers of individuals in different age or stage classes as vectors of abundance. And so n at times t, a population at a certain time, is equal to the numbers or proportions of individuals in each stage class from 1 to k at a certain time. So this vector we could also call x. For every population, 
we can make a matrix of transition probabilities for each stage or age class there's a probability of staying the same and a probability of moving up to the next class or down to the previous class. So this Leslie matrix or A has K, is a K by K matrix where K is the number of age classes and in this matrix the top row here is the fertilities of each age class how many seeds they could produce and here along this diagonal is the probability of staying the same each of the others is a transition probability and the dominant eigenvalue is lambda and so this is where lambda can come from in linear algebra terms. So lambda, that matrix, is what we multiply the population vector, that vertical thing we saw initially showing the numbers of proportions of each of individuals in each age or stage class by to get the result of what it, it, things will be like in the next time interval. Lambda the dominant eigenvalue of the transition matrix, A, is simply the finite rate of increase. So that A, that matrix, times the vector x, is equal to lambda times x. And remember also that lambda can tell us a lot about a population. If it's equal to 1, the population stays the same. If it's greater than 1, the population increases <clears throat> and if it's less than 1, the population is decreasing in size. And little r is similar but different. If little r is 0, the population size stays the same. If it's greater than 0, it increases. If it's less than 0, it decreases. So to summarize what I've just been talking about, if we want to know what a population size will be at in the next time interval, at time plus 1, we can multiply the vector of age stages or abundances here times the transition matrix here. So we get a new population vector for the next time interval if we multiply A, the transition matrix, times the population at times T, the initial time, which is that vector of abundance with constant birth rate and death rate, the populations will converge on a stable age distribution regardless of their initial structure. So let's consider first this insect example where very simple life cycle, it goes like in a something with incomplete metamorphosis, a little cricket or grasshopper, from egg to larva to adult. Only the adults can have offspring, F, adult to egg. And here's P from E to L, from egg to larva. Here, the transition probability from larva to adult. And here are the probabilities of staying the same, an adult remaining an adult or a larva remaining a larva. So if we put these into the matrix, the probability of an egg staying an egg doesn't exist. So that's here. An egg can't remain an egg. It has to hatch. Here's the probability of the larva staying the larva and the adult staying the adult. And then here, the probability of the egg becoming a larva, the probability of a larva becoming an adult, and the fecundity of the adult is here. The other values in this matrix are zero. Those transition probabilities don't exist. And now let's look at the matrix for this little cactus, Corypantha robensorum. The probabilities of staying the same are all here. The stages are small juveniles, large juveniles, and adults. This matrix hasn't taken into account the seeds or seedlings because 
sometimes those are hard to determine in a shorter term study. But here along the diagonal are the probabilities of staying in the same size class. The probability of going from 1 to 2 here, 3 to 2 here, the probability of going from 2 to 1 here, which is probably 0, and 3 to 2 here, and then th of 3 to 1, regressing in size. Maybe this can happen if things get eaten, but the way cactuses grow, I don't think so. So the data at the bottom are taken from actual populations of the plant where transition probabilities differ at different sites. Site A with a northeastern exposure, B with a southwestern exposure, and C on a hilltop. You can see that Site A has the greatest probability of staying the same down the middle. In the, the southwestern exposure, things may be the most um, difficult or dry, and the transition probabilities are lower of going from one stage class to the next than they are for Site C. So we can use sensitivities and elasticities to tell us how lambda changes as the individual matrix elements change. How sensitive is lambda to the, each different element? The sensitivities compare things measured at different scales. Elasticities are proportional changes in lambda caused by a proportional change in a matrix element and so for many considerations. They usually make a little more sense. Looking at the data from the little cactus populations in three different areas, we can see the proportional contributions of each matrix element to the changes in lambda for this cactus. There's a lot of contribution from the adult stage the highest bar here, but we can see the proportional heights of these different matrix elements change. And to read this, it's going from this stage to this stage. So this is, for example, um, large juveniles to large juveniles staying the same. Here would be large juveniles going to adults. So for site A, this transition in the, in the middle from large juveniles staying the same probably has the greatest influence on lambda. Whereas in other populations, that's not true. Here, adults going to small juveniles. This is kind of large. I have to think about what that means. In the next little lecture we'll look at an example of a study that was done on a plant right here in South Florida.